With Capella University's FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree online at your own pace and get support from people who care about your success. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. As a person with a very deep voice, I'm hired all the time for advertising campaigns. But a deep voice doesn't sell B2B. And advertising on the wrong platform doesn't sell B2B either. That's why if you're a B2B marketer, you should use LinkedIn ads. LinkedIn has the targeting capabilities to help you reach the world's largest professional audience. That's right, over 70 million decision makers all in one place. All the big wigs, then medium wigs. Also small wigs who are on the path to becoming big wigs. Okay, that's enough about wigs. LinkedIn ads allows you to focus on getting your B2B message to the right people. So, does that mean you should use ads on LinkedIn instead of hiring me, the man with the deepest voice in the world? Yes. Yes, it does. Get started today and see why LinkedIn is the place to be to be. We'll even give you a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. Planning an international trip and want to learn the language of your destination? Then check out the language learning program Rosetta Stone on desktop or as an app. Rosetta Stone is designed to immerse you in the language you're learning. Plus, the True Accent feature even gives you feedback on your pronunciation. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a very limited time, listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com today. I am so confused. I have never seen so many important national, even world issues debated over their constitutional merit. Like the constitution is like starting to be in the news. Like take the Texas border, feds versus the states. Take Colorado. Does the state have the right to decide who's on the national presidential ballot? And on and on, COVID, was it constitutional to close down all the businesses? Might have been the correct decision, but I'm just curious. Does it get in the way of our ability to have life, liberty, and property unless due process shuts us down? So I asked a world-famous constitutional expert. He's the author of the book, The Odd Clauses, about uh, many of the oddest clauses in the Constitution. He's a professor at Boston University teaching constitutional law, Jay Wexler. I get to ask him questions, and he tells me which of these recent events were constitutional and which might not have been. So here it is. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show, So Jay, I have, I have a bunch of questions about the constitution as related to current events, because I feel like more than I've ever seen in the past 24 years, 25 years, I'm, I'm thinking like Gore Bush, that election, I haven't seen so many constitutional battles, like on the front page of the news, the, as, as I am these past few weeks and few years. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's probably right. I mean, it's a combination of uh, a president who doesn't follow any of the, or former president who doesn't follow norms. Uh, and so it gives rise to these issues that, you know, constitutional law professors, for example, have been like thinking about, but never thought would actually occur. Uh, uh, and, that, and so it's a combination of that, I think, plus a new Supreme court that is uh, willing to, change its view on lots of things. So that invites, you know, uh, cases to be brought that, that they basically invite cases that w which they can use to kind of rethink the law. So uh, I can see how that would, uh, you know, how you could perceive that because it's, it, I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I think it probably is true. And let's start with a very broad question, like the Supreme Court in the Constitution didn't have the power to, to decide what was constitutional or not. 
So that's well, it's unclear. That's it was, something that, yeah, right. I mean, it, until eighteen oh three, it w- that wasn't clear, right? I mean, I think some the framers probably thought that the court had judicial the power of judicial review, but it wasn't it wasn't clear, and it wasn't until John Marshall, uh, uh, you know, took took the lead of the Supreme Court and made it into a, a powerful institution. And Marbury versus Madison announced that there was this power of judicial review. So yeah, once we started that, it was inevitable that the court would become more powerful. Marbury versus Madison is a fascinating case. I love teaching it. It's really, it's very cool. What was the case? <laughs> well, I mean, what's so interesting about the case is that, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to, I can't get into all the details, but 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 Marshall did not have to decide the issue. He did not have to reach the question of whether there was judicial review or not. He sort of misread on purpose, both the part of the constitution he was interpreting and the statute that was, arguably in violation of the Constitution. He read them to conflict with each other so that he could come up with a, a you know, announce the power of judicial review. Uh, I don't think pe- most people know that, but it's not at all clear when you look at the language of the constitutional provision about original jurisdiction and appellate jurisdiction, and then the statute, which purported to give the the Supreme Court you know, uh, original jurisdiction, but not appellate jurisdiction to do this thing, to order the delivery of an appointment of a judge. So he manufactured it all. And and not only that, he, it, it's fascinating because he was, he should have re- recused himself too, because he was, had been the secretary of state uh, when the the commissions to the judges were, were signed. He signed them because he was the, he was the secretary of state and the chief justice of the Supreme court at the same time. And uh, so, so he did all these sort of maneuvers to, to, to be able to, be in the case and then decide the case in the way he wanted and then to create this powerful institution. Pretty but, th- but that's an interesting thing too. And this is, this is actually related to one of the constitutional issues happening now, but you know, you can't be according to the constitution. And this is a little known clause. You mentioned it in your book, the odd clauses. You can't be a Senator or a Congressman and work in the executive branch at the same time because of the separation of powers. How come it's the case that you can't you can be in in the executive branch and at least in this case the judicial branch? Yeah. So for one thing, I don't I don't think um, uh, anybody like cared about about the the issue in eighteen oh three. So nobody. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some people did say, "Hey, you can't do both of these things." But I don't think it was particularly controversial at the time. So you know, sometimes parts of the Constitution lie dormant uh, for a long time before they're, they they become part of the national conversation or people recognize that they're their importance. But also it's I think the terms of that of that uh, constitutional provision you're talking about, the incompatibility clause, only applies to members of the legislative branch and the executive, right? So so it might still be the case you could be the a Supreme Court justice and a Secretary of State. I hope not. I, I don't think under general principles of separation of powers law you could, but it's possible. Well, I it seems like it. it seems like if they if they planned it between you know they they really put this separation of powers in between Congress and the executive office, they should have done it for the judicial branch and the executive branch. But it seems like they forgot it or decided <laughs> for really some know. reason it wasn't as important. Maybe there's a story there. Uh, there probably is a story. I don't know it. Um, uh, but I've never heard, you know, I've never, I, I also don't know all the historical kind of scholarship about Marbury versus Madison and John Marshall. I've read some books and things about it, but I don't, rem- I don't remember anybody, you know, it being a big deal that he was doing both things at once. Uh, maybe, it, and you know, maybe it's because at the time the Supreme Court wasn't so powerful. And in fact, you know, there were, there were people who turned down I believe the chief justice position. They were like, I, I don't want to be in this little court. I've got, you know, businesses and, and uh, other things to do. Like the Supreme Court wasn't the Supreme Court until Marshall made it the Supreme Court uh, through Marbury versus Madison and some other cases. So, so perhaps it wasn't even viewed as like a big deal at all. Like, so, so somebody's a secretary of state in the Supreme, in the, on the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court's not a big deal anyway, perhaps. We've actually, um, just as a side note, we we have this podcast has visited the Supreme Court because I think the only Supreme Court justice who's ever been on a podcast was Sonia Sotomayor was on uh-huh. this podcast. Oh, awesome! So, yeah. So, um, okay. The the yeah, it was very interesting, and I was very pleased that she she actually reached out to me to come on the podcast. Okay. And uh, 
So, okay. So the questions I have, first one is this, this Texas border thing. So, you know, Texas has, um, this one area, uh, near a town called Eagles pass, I guess, where the, the Texas border patrol or the Texas national guard has put up razor wire on the wall and the Biden administration wants to take down the razor wire. And this has gone all the way up to the Supreme court, which since, since it's the part of the federal laws that the federal government is in charge of the border, the Supreme court ruled that the federal laws override the state laws. And so that was the, the, the federal argument is that they override the state. And now the state argument, so governor Greg Abbott, his argument was, is that there's a clause in the constitution, which says that if the federal government does not respond to an invasion, then the state has power to fight the invasion. And he labeled the immigration an invasion. Now, subtext to this is that what is, what constitute is immigration is illegal immigration and invasion. That's not specified in the, in the constitution, but James Madison has written in, uh, in another place that immigration does not count as an invasion. So it's, so, so what's, what's the answer? There's all these disputes and the, and the Supreme court ruled that the federal government does override the state in this case, but there was loopholes and, and so on. So it's still ongoing. Right. And uh, that, that's a great, you know, question because it raises uh, this, uh, this, this issue about how constitutional provisions uh, who, even people who teach constitutional law, you know, may for 10 years or whatever, might not have even really thought of or paid attention to. And that, that clause that you're talking about, I'm, I'm, I got my constitution right here, <laughs> little, little guy, you got to keep one everywhere, right? If you're a con law professor, right? So it's, it's section 10 of article one, which says, you know, a state, uh, a state can't engage in war unless actually invaded, um, actually, 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 invade. you know, so I, the word actually is pretty fascinating there. Like, yeah, and like, they could have uh, just said in, unless invaded. In the, right. And 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 so that, you know, that word people will uh, scholars will d- debate, like, why is that there? Does that mean that it has to be like an invasion that's like a real invasion? So you, it, it like limits the word invasion, et cetera. So, I, I you know, it, it seems to me like immigration is not an invasion. That that seems fair. Like, I think that 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 the the framers of the constitution would have used a different word if they were including, but uh, if they were going to include uh, immigration there, but, uh, but, but that could be incorrect as well. I'm no, not, I'm not an originalist, so well, I don't know, but know, you know, everything about why they, why they put that in there. Um, but it, it is, uh, it's fascinating, right? So what, so, and then if it were an invasion, then what what effect would that have on the federal government's ability to go in and, and cut the wire, right? Cut the razor wire, which is what the case is right all about. I love that 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 case came up. It came up right when I was teaching this classic old another jo- uh, a John Marshall case called McCulloch versus Maryland, which is about whether a state could tax the the Bank of the United States. And the Supreme Court said a state can't you know, tax the United States, that would give the state the power to destroy the federal government. And it was one of those early cases that established that the federal government was kind of supreme to the states at a, it, when they conflict on most issues. And so the, the United States brief on this issue in the Supreme Court starts right off and says, you know, since 1810 or whenever McCulloch versus Maryland was decided, you know, this kind of thing has not been allowed. And, and, and so it was like, it was like this famous old case brought to the to the modern day, and I, you know, I think that's probably why what the you know why the Supreme Court held the way it did that the that this is the federal government, the states in a conflict over something that's really about federal law, and the states can't get in the way of the uh, uh, of the feds take care of the border. So it was a just an illustration of this age old or two hundred year old principle uh, that Mar- that that Marshall announced. And does it specify in the Constitution that? Um, the Fed, the federal government is in charge of the border, protecting the border. Uh, yeah, I, I Congress pretty much is given uh, uh, is given the power to to regulate uh, immigration. The president, um, well, yeah, no, I, uh, I, I, it certainly has been interpreted that the federal government has, and particularly Congress, has kind of what they call plenary power over immigration. So, and. So I think that's pretty well established, at least by the courts interpreting the Constitution. 
there may be language in the Constitution that could give rise to an argument the other way. I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah. So in in I guess it's uh, Section Nine of Article One. It says uh, the migration or importation importation. Uh, right. Right. Yeah. T- they're, they're, everybody, uh, people who were already immigrating right then were grandfathered in until 1808. And then after that, Congress is in charge. Right. So, uh, so, not, yeah. mm-hmm. so the question is though, um, I guess there's Greg Abbott's question, which is, which, which you're addressing, which, um, was it an invasion or not? In which case he could say the federal government's not acting how it should. So he needs to take over. And then there's, I guess, I guess, well, I guess that is the main, the main issue. Then, then I guess there's the fact that it's only this specific idea that the federal government has the idea to cut the razor wire down, but it doesn't say anything about Texas putting new razor wire back up immediately. So that's the loophole that has, has been in place right now. And they'll, and they'll go back and forth, right. Um, until the court, you know, issues some, some final ruling, which they haven't in this particular case. And, and, but even then, you know, then what happens, right? The court, the court doesn't have its, uh, any enforcement power, right? The court doesn't have, uh, it has no money and it has no army, right? The court can't enforce its own rulings. It's a pretty interesting thing. But the federal government can. The federal government can, right? And they'll say, uh, and and they'll say we have the authority under, uh, you know, uh, under the court's decisions and, and maybe they'll, you know, they'll keep battling, perhaps, if the state doesn't give in. I'm not sure the state made the invasion argument in its briefs in that case, or if it was it was a later, you know, thing that Abbott was talking about that might make its way into the into the into the case later. I'm not sure about that. The court didn't say anything about right. That its decision was was there was it was one of these orders without explanation. So it's unclear if the court thought about this invasion argument if it is presented to the to it properly or we'll just think about it later and it also not sure that even if it is invasion that gives the state the rights to the right to act whether if the feds decide to jump in instead uh whether the feds you know might be able to uh, to to sort of preempt the state's decision right so in other words i think it's a separate question whether the state has the power to act if there's no federal action versus the state versus the, the state having power to repel the federal government if the federal government decides it wants to step in. And I I'd see. be really I'd be really surprised if the state ends up prevailing on that, even even with this court. So so right. So so whether or not it's invasion, if the federal government acts, then they acted. And the state doesn't have any power over that. Like in like right. back in 1800 or 1790 or whenever, the federal government sometimes couldn't muster an army fast enough to act and hence this clause it was the real original reason for this clause so but it's interesting can the federal government but like texas is the main state i guess california also that uh essentially protects the border and i guess it's an interesting question well that's not totally true there's also the northern border there's plenty of states on the southern border but it's an interesting question like yeah like it's an interesting question if if the if if the people in texas if texas itself as a state is overwhelmed by immigration do they have no power at all right right and uh, yeah that's a great it's a good question they would say that that's what's happened right um the feds would would say you know we're we're doing what we can and that it's our kind of you know it's our area and and if we're acting at all and we are you know maybe not to texas's liking it's really the fed's tr- decision and texas is, has to resort to the political process uh to try to get right the federal government to act differently i mean i think that's you know because otherwise you get all these you know each state making its own sort of immigration policy and 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 this the, the court at least has always thought has always talked about how we need kind of one voice when it comes to international relations foreign affairs and i think that includes immigration also so you know i, I, I this this is a court that's highly solicitous of state states rights and i you know i understand that but i i think on this kind of question i i think i'd be i would be really surprised if the court would would decide with texas 
Okay, because because then there's the of course the I guess it's the Tenth Amendment which says any law is not specifically prescribed by the federal government goes to the states. But you can argue, like you just said, that immigration is something that the Constitution has specifically said is you know foreign relations in general is something that's uh, you know done by the president and Congress and so on. Right, right. And so if the Constitution gives the federal government the power to handle immigration, then then the Tenth Amendment doesn't. Uh, you know, wouldn't kick in. I mean, the 10th amendment, it's interesting how the court has interpreted the 10th amendment over the time, over, over the years. Basically the, the only thing the court has said the 10th amendment does is prevent the federal government from ordering states to do things directly. Um, and, and that's come up some, you know, several times. It's kind of the whole reason why uh, marijuana can be legal at the state level while it's not legal at the federal level because the federal government can't order states to make it illegal because that would violate the 10th Amendment. Um, that's the sort of the 10th Amendment's quiet uh, power in, that we that I think most people don't recognize. Uh, well, what does that mean, actually? Like, does that mean Congress can pass a law against murder, for instance? Every state has to pass their own law against murder? Well, uh, so the United States can pass uh, can can promulgate a a, a a murder statute, but it has to be um, connected to some existing federal power. So um, and usually that federal power is uh, the Commerce Clause power. Which so so uh, Article One, Section Eight lays out all these specific powers that Congress has, and the the most broad of those powers is this thing called the Commerce Clause, which gives the Congress the power to make rules if they have significant effects on interstate commerce, kind of. And so the federal criminal laws are limited because they have to have this kind of interstate, usually have to have some interstate uh, aspect to them or something. Um, but um, so that would be the, there would be a federal murder law in particular situations. Um, and then, of course, the state, uh, Wait, the original question was, <laughs> remind me of the original so, question. <laughs> so, so if someone fills up on, on gas, if a murderer fills up on gas in New Jersey and then drives to New York and kills, some, kills someone, does that break the federal murder law? Like, because there's there was commerce done in New Jersey in order to kill someone in New York. Right, yeah. No, I'd have to look at the federal murder law. But but that would be the kind of uh, murder that the feds could reach. But most cr- most criminal laws are, are state, you know, are state uh, are created by the state and implemented and implemented by the state and exec, you know, enforced by the state. But there, it, it, it and, and there's different crimes too, right? You could that's why the federal government could could uh, could enforce. You know, sometimes the state somebody gets off on state law, but then the feds prosecute them, right? So they're separate because they're separate sovereigns. So there's no double jeopardy problem and. Um, so it's a yeah it's a uh, the relationship between the feds and the states and, and we're doing that right now in constitutional law in my class it's uh, it's it's fascinating. Yes, it's totally true. Airbnb has changed my life. If anything, they have made my life so much better. Like I used to live in Airbnbs. I I lived in over a hundred or 200 different Airbnbs over a three year period. And I loved it. I loved, I became a really good guest of Airbnbs and I got to know lots of hosts. So when I initially owned a house, I, of course, the first thing I thought was I'm going to turn my house into an Airbnb because I travel a lot. So why leave my house unused when I can make a side income by letting others Airbnb my house or come to stay in my house as guests and having my own Airbnb or or being a host for Airbnb has allowed me to do just that. And I've met other hosts. I've actually spoken at Airbnb's host conference. I think it was in 2017. I met so many just nice hosts. It's a great community and I love you know, turning my own home into an Airbnb. Like I'm traveling to Austin next month. My home's going to be an Airbnb while I'm away and I'll stay in an Airbnb. I'd rather stay in like a three-story house Airbnb than in one tiny hotel room in, in the middle of Austin during South by Southwest. So listen, while you're away, your home could be an Airbnb. Many people host on Airbnb, but there are people 
who are just letting their house sit empty, who've never thought about it or didn't realize their space could be an Airbnb. Hosting can easily fit into your lifestyle and is a great way to earn some extra money. So if you have a home, but you're not always at home, then you have an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. For those who embrace the impossible, the Defender 110 is up for the adventure. This iconic vehicle has been redefined with a modern design that lets you go further and do more. The exterior is reimagined with compelling proportions and precise detailing, complemented by an interior built with integrity. The Defender capability is legendary. Whether you're facing off-road challenges or harsh weather conditions, its durability has been tested to the extreme. Powerful innovations like the intuitive driver display and award-winning infotainment system keep you connected. Innovative camera technologies deliver unobstructed views and effortless maneuvering. And robust cargo capacity means more room for your gear. Ready for a wide range of adventures, the Defender family features the two-door Defender 90, the Defender 110, and the Defender 130, which seats up to eight. To drive the Defender is to explore with greater confidence. Push what's possible with a vehicle made to go further. The Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Well, related to this then, kind of on the other side of things is Colorado. So Colorado there's a couple of interesting issues here. First off, Colorado is saying that they don't want to put Trump on the ballot because it says in the constitution that nobody who has been involved in an insurrection can go on the ballot. And this was in the 14th amendment. It was probably made to apply to anybody who was involved in the civil war, can't be president of the United States. And so, so they're kind of invoking that amendment to say Trump can't be on the ballot and the federal this has gone up to the Supreme court and the Supreme court's basically said the states don't have the power to decide who the president of the United States is. So it's almost similar to the, the, that case you mentioned where Maryland can't tax the United States. So the, a state can't do something that affects the whole United States. And, and that seems to be where the Supreme court, I don't know if they've invoked the 10th amendment or what, but, but that's what they decided. Yeah, well, no, they haven't decided the case yet. Um, I mean, they hear an oral argument on it. I mean, unless something happened today. No, <laughs> Did something I, happen today? No, I, mean, no, I, I don't know. Um, no, I mean, I think I think you're right that that's how it's going to come out based on how the oral argument went, right? Um, the there's the, there's a lot of issues in that case. That's a really complicated case, and it was kind of um, court watchers are really interested to see what the questions were going to be because there are a lot of different ways the court could go on it. Um, uh, I think almost everybody thinks the court will will say that Colorado can't do what it what it wanted to do, but it, but it, but there are all sorts of reasons why the court could decide that it could be you know there's a whole argument about in the case about whether the president is actually is an officer of the United States under the Constitution, um, and that you know that was at, asked about at the oral argument briefly, but probably not enough that that it indicates that that's how the court's going to go. The court seem to be very concerned with, as you say, the state's, the state power here and the federalism concerns, like why, right? The the constitution doesn't say how that prohibition um, uh, on, on, on somebody involved in an insurrection can't be president, how that gets enforced or becomes, you know, part of the, 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 it actually gets implemented. The Constitution is unclear about that. To the extent it says anything, it sort of sounds like Congress should do it because Congress has the power to enforce the 14th Amendment under Section 5 of that amendment. Um, you know, whether states can use the access to their ballots to to do it, uh, it's it's kind of a hard, hard argument for the states to make. Um, I, I mean, I, Justice Kagan, you know, said, asked, asked that we're arguing, you know, why should the state of Colorado be able to decide who becomes president or not? And I think every, everybody has that feeling that, that this is not something that each state one by one can do. At the same time, I don't think the Fed, the Supreme Court's going to decide like what counts as an insurrection and was, you know, Trump sufficiently involved that he shouldn't be, that he's bit barred from the ballot. Um, well, that was the yeah. other question I had was if, if I were on the Trump legal team here, I was, has there been due process that says Trump was involved in an insurrection? That yeah, that was an issue a, a bit at the uh, at the 
at the argument. I'm not sure the due process necessarily, um, you know, attaches to that particular, um, you know, provision. I mean, and if it did, what it would re what it would look like? Um, how would you, you know, how does just does he have to be criminally, uh, you know, found guilty of participating in an insurrection? Nobody, I think, has been charged under the insurrection statute with respect to January 6th. Um, uh, you know, does yeah, the what, what have they been charged they... with? Like, break, <laughs> like entering the Capitol without permission or like what, what was yeah, the law that know. most people broke? I'm not really sure. Uh, but, 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 but not the insurrection law. Not the, ins right. There is a law that prohibits insurrection. It's a, fe a federal law. But in, and as I understand it, none of the January 6th people have been indicted under it. Um, though it's been used maybe once or twice or something in the past. Uh, so, and, but there was the impeach, you know, is the impeachment, does that provide you, does that count as due process if due process supplies? Um, or is this just a political kind of decision, you know, um, such that maybe it, it doesn't require due process. So I think that's kind of up in the air too, but, but, but you're right. Like, uh, um, or, or would the, would the arguments being, being made before the court in this context constitute due process like they they would be arguing in the briefs about it in, in the lower courts you know was this an insurrection what did he do you know what did he do does that count as due process um i don't think we'll ever find out but uh, the, but yeah go ahead. The, the other thing is can't a state isn't it one of the powers of this state to decide who is on their ballot like every state has different rules about who is on their ballot. Like you have to have a certain number of signatures. You have to be, have, have a certain number of amount of cash, maybe, um, you know, in your, in your campaign funds. So if that's a state power, couldn't they decide? I mean, they certainly decide a lot of candidates don't go on the ballot. Why do they have to put a Republican or Democrat candidate on the ballot? Yeah. So I'm, I don't know that area a lot that well. What I do know though, is that uh, is that the court has said the con uh, that the states can't add qualifications uh, to the the particular officers, federal officers, uh, and that might be the distinction. Like they can do a lot for state officers, but maybe not as much for federal officers and uh, and their access to the to the ballots. Um, the the court has said that states can't add to the qualifications that are in the Constitution that are. Like the president has to be thirty-five, you know, and be a citizen of so long, et cetera. And and uh, at one point, a state, maybe it was Alabama, wanted to uh, impose term limits for their members of Congress, and so they 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 basically said, you know, if you've been uh, a senator for two terms, then you can't be, have access to the ballot. And the court said, no, you can't do that because that's basically a state adding um, adding a qualification for federal office to that to those that are included in the constitution and that the states can't do. And that case came up a bunch during this oral argument. So, so I, 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 I don't think the state's going to prevail on that, uh, on that strategy. And I'm just trying to think now from the, from the state's point of view, the state doesn't allow everybody who's running for president on the ballot. So for, if you go to fbc.gov and fill out 10 minutes worth of paperwork, to run for president, then you're officially a federal candidate for president. I know this because I've done it. I'm officially a federal candidate for president, but I cannot get on the Colorado ballot no matter what, because Colorado has qualifications. Like you have to get a certain number of signatures and maybe your party had to be on the ballot the prior four years. So there are state by state rules about which presidential candidate is allowed on the ballot. And this was a case though, I guess, where Trump, if he gets the nomination, would have satisfied all the qualifications, but they're still saying he can't go on the ballot because of this insurrection idea. And yeah, that's I, your, I, I don't know. Do I mean, I, I you might have a lawsuit um, <laughs> if you can't get on I'm the ballot. Suing. No, I, you, you should. You should sue. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have to look into that. Like, I, I, you know, I don't know why the states would be able to uh, not allow you on the ballot. Well, because there's there's thousands of people officially running. So uh -huh. you have to figure out like RFK Jr. can't get on the ballot in, in many states. I don't know if he's going to make 50% of the states or not, but, uh, you know, the two party systems never been was specified in the constitution, but that seems kind of encased in state law, state by state. So I'm just curious where the state's rights end there 
and and you know the federal begins but it it seems like what what they're saying though that that might be the problem i guess is that tr- you know donald trump would make all the qualifications and they're still going to say he he can't be on the ballot for this federal reason the insurrection reason so like for instance can a state not put someone on the ballot if they're 29 years old so in the constitution it says you have to be 35 you bring this up in your book the odd clauses is the state allowed to not put someone on the ballot mm-hmm. and they've met all their rules but they're 29 years old uh and, and then it's up to the federal to just say this guy can't be president if he wins i don't you know that did come up at the oral argument um the, the question was kind of like let's say a state decided not to al- a- allow access to the ballot to somebody who was was going to be 35 at the time of the election maybe but 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 or it wasn't going to be 35 at the time of the election, but would have been 35 at the time of that they would take office of president. And that and the argument was that they that the, that they could not keep somebody off the, the ballot in that situation. I, this sounds like, you know, I, I'm uh, wary of getting into uh, stuff that I know very little about because I'll say something. Uh, you know, the, the the careful lawyer in me, I guess, uh, is wary about this. I because I, I I think that the states have. Maybe there's some federal laws that regulate the stuff, and that's where all this stuff comes from. But from what my, uh, you know, listening to this oral argument, there is really, uh, everyone seemed to agree that there is really a lot of restrictions on what the states could, could do to keep people off the ballot for federal office. So I'm just going to have to do some research. <laughs> but, it, I mean, it sounds like the Supreme Court, though, says you can't, you can't get in the way of, again, it's that, it's that, it's that Maryland versus the bank of the U S case. Like you can't, a state can't do something that's going to affect the livelihoods of everybody else in the United States. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 the, whether it's, you know, going to be specifically that case or just sort of the general principles that come, I, I think it's unclear what the source of the, this ruling is going to be, whether it's kind of a, a gen, maybe it will draw on the 10th amendment. I wouldn't be, you know, who knows? Um, um, but, but, but it, it just, it, it, it seems clear what the what the court was concerned about and what it doesn't want to happen. And then now it's got to figure out kind of a way uh, to to make it happen. And I'm sure there is there's a way there are many ways to do it. And it'll, that might be what they're you know debating about now why they haven't issued an opinion yet. You know, f- figuring out exactly what they're going to rest their decision on. That happens so, okay. all the time. Yeah. So I I have a, a now this is probably a bigger question and this involves. It, this is in 2020 COVID when essentially, I don't know if it was the federal government or state by state, but essentially every business was required to shut down. And I'm not arguing whether this was a good thing or a bad thing or whether more lives were lost if, if this hadn't occurred or, or lives were saved because this did occur. But in the fifth amendment, it says, uh, essentially no one should be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And like I had a business on the streets of Manhattan in New York City, and it was of course shut down by COVID. And did that not deprive me of liberty and property um, with, you know, nor shall private property be taken for public use, again, without due process of law and without just compensation. So, this due process of law part is what bothers me with the COVID shutdowns. There, there really was no due process for any business and many, many generational businesses and families lost their whole incomes, went bankrupt. You know, it was just a catastrophe on a, on a business side. Again, this is, I'm not arguing whether it saved lives or not this law, but was this unconstitutional, this law? You know, so I, there was a period of time uh, in the between like 1905 and 1937, specifically 1937, during which uh, the Supreme Court said that the due process clause placed like really strong limits on the, the government's authority to regulate businesses in all sorts of ways. And uh, basically said it was it, 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 like a regulation that said, for example, uh, a, a business couldn't 
uh, hire use child labor, for example. Um, you know, that, that, that's that that might not be the right case to use, but um, uh, like wage hour laws, those kinds of things. The court struck lots of those laws down in this period, um, and that period was co- it was known as the Lochner era because it, it was there was a case, a famous case about the hours that bakers could work and. Uh, the Supreme Court said that those those regulations were unconstitutional because they violated the due process rights of businesses. Um, and but the court sort of made a 180 degree change on that in 1937. And that, that actually was the kind of the switch, the switch in time, the save nine, that whole classic thing, which saved the, the court because Owen Roberts, one of the Supreme Court justices who was always striking things down, switched his vote. And, and since then, I would say kind of general regulations uh, of businesses of all sorts have received kind of the lo- lowest amount of scrutiny under the due process clause that the court uses. Basically, the court has said any kind of rational regulation, uh, any regulation that has any kind of reason, reasonable justification is sufficient for due process purposes. And so... Um, you know, I think that's one. One could disagree with that, of course, um, uh, but that's what the court has said, and uh, and has never, you know, sort of revived this old period uh, of the, from the Lochner era. So, so there's really little kinds of little that uh, in the due process clause that businesses have been able to rely on. Uh, that may be not, uh, you know, a good thing in all circumstances, but that's what the court has said. I think in in some states though, where where this was brought to court, uh, businesses sued. It got up to the state supreme court. I don't think it ever went up to the Supreme Court, and it was struck down as unconstitutional. The closing of businesses. I think it was in Minnesota or Wisconsin. I'm sorry, I forget which state. But I think I think it became like an open issue. But you know, eventually the lockdowns r- relaxed, and and it didn't go all the way up to the Supreme Court. I um. So I'm not familiar with those state cases. What I what I do remember uh, are the cases involving religion, because I my um, you know I teach law and religion. And it's been a long focus of mine, and so there's some really interesting cases about if the government closes churches, right, or places regulations on on religious get-togethers, various kinds. Um, you know, are those constitutional uh, or not? Do those violate the kind of the free exercise of religion rights of these churches and other religious institutions? And the Supreme Court decided several cases where they com- kind of compared the restrictions that were placed on religion to the restrictions that were placed on other kinds of businesses. And if the court didn't think that they were kind of the same, the court uh, that they treated religion worse than other sorts of businesses, then the court had struck down the. That like the there was a law in Brooklyn um, that that fell under this sort of theory. The court the court thought that that that, that New York or uh, yeah, the state of New York had treated religious groups worse than say uh, supermarkets, and so that was a problem. That was that was fascinating. I thought. Was like, well, in what in what way were uh, supermarkets treated differently? Well, like so, so, so if I remember right, in this case, like supermarkets uh, were open. You know, there were some restrictions on how many people could go in the supermarkets, but the churches were closed, uh, or they had very few people were allowed in them. And then there were also laws about um, like performances, theater, comedy, uh, concerts, sporting events, right? The, and and they were closed. And the question was. Um, you know, are, are the churches kind of more like uh, like the like the sporting events where people are yelling and singing, or are they more like the supermarkets where people are just sort of gathering and doing you know their daily business? And the and Justice Sotomayor said, "Look, it's they're they're treated the same way as theaters and 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 sporting events churches are, and that makes sense because people are singing and you know so they have to be." Tr- you know, clamp down on more than the, the the supermarkets where people aren't singing and chanting or whatever, and, and are, are those are safer. So, but the court, the majority of the court disagreed and thought, look, if you're going to close the supermarkets, um, I mean, if you're going to if you're going to leave the supermarkets open, am I getting this right? This is like the LSAT. Uh, if you're keeping the supermarkets open, then then you got to keep the churches open. And uh, so that's that's how that case came out, if I remember right. So I wonder if that's also related to the COVID situation because supermarkets were kept open, 
but churches oh, yeah. closed. This is all COVID. These were all COVID cases uh, that I'm talking about. So, and and that's what the court, you know, focused it. So like not so much the due process on on ordinary businesses that never made it to the, the the Supreme Court, but the but the religion closings did make it to the Supreme Court. And so, what did they end up concluding that? The, they concluded the, basically the rule is that that the government has to treat religious religion as as kind of as well as it treats any other similarly situated activity. So uh, if you close, um, so if you keep supermarkets open, you got to keep the churches open to the same extent. That's kind of what the majority of the court said, and the dissenter said that that supermarkets and stores like that are not the proper analogy. Uh, to churches and that you should look to what the government's doing about singing and theaters and sporting events. So uh, I, wa and, I wonder if a sports event could have said, okay, this is actually a religious service. And in the middle of the religious service, we're going to play the Super Bowl. <laughs> I wonder if that, <laughs> I wonder if that would have solved the problem for sporting events. Well, religion does help you with the Supreme court. That's for sure. So maybe. As a person with a very deep voice, I'm hired all the time for advertising campaigns. But a deep voice doesn't sell B2B. And advertising on the wrong platform doesn't sell B2B either. That's why if you're a B2B marketer, you should use LinkedIn ads. LinkedIn has the targeting capabilities to help you reach the world's largest professional audience. That's right. Over 70 million decision makers all in one place. All the big wigs, then medium wigs. Also small wigs who are on the path to becoming big wigs. Okay, that's enough about Wix. LinkedIn ads allows you to focus on getting your B2B message to the right people. So, does that mean you should use ads on LinkedIn instead of hiring me, the man with the deepest voice in the world? Yes. Yes, it does. Get started today and see why LinkedIn is the place to be to be. We'll even give you a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. Planning an international trip and want to learn the language of your destination? Then check out the language learning program Rosetta Stone on desktop or as an app. Rosetta Stone is designed to immerse you in the language you're learning. Plus, the True Accent feature even gives you feedback on your pronunciation. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a very limited time, listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com today. So one issue which has occurred ever since the Civil War is the issue of secession. Does the Constitution spell out when a state can secede? And I'm thinking again of this Texas stuff. And there's a movie coming out next month called The Civil War. And uh -huh. what's, so this is going to be a question that people are going to have. What makes it, is it possible for a state to secede legally? Now, Abraham Lincoln yeah. would say no, and right. prob correctly for him at that time, he, he did a, a, the right thing. But just what's the Constitution say about it? I don't think the Constitution, the text of the Constitution addresses that, uh, the succession question. I, 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 honestly, uh, it's another area where I'm, uh, I, it's, it's, I, 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 there, I bet there's a lot of writing and a lot of thinking about it, and I don't, it's just, it doesn't, it's, not something I happen to know about. So, but I don't think there's anything in the constitution. There's no process for, for secession, like that you would, you would expect, right. If, if it, if it was contemplated by the framers, right. A state can decide to secede if it has a vote of this or that, but you know, there's going to be, there are going to be theories like um, um, the, the, that the, that the federal government is a creation of the various states and if a state, you know, wants to re withdraw its consent then it can do so. But the con the response would be, will be that the, the constitution is derived from the power of the people, not the states. Um, and uh, that states have no authority to, to leave the union. I, I, that I think, I bet that's uh, the prevailing view is that, but, uh, but I, th that there's, that secession is kind of contrary to the principles of the constitution, but I, I'm sure there are also well thought out arguments on the other side. Uh, I, uh, right. As you said, we have the civil war precedent, but, but have we seen anything since it would, you think we we will, uh, that'd be kind of interesting. 
what would have happened if, you know, the the army and the Texas National Guard came to blows, so to speak, and Texas said, you know what, we're out. Count us out. <laughs> we're done. We're done with this shit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, we're, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, right. Texas famously has had six flags. Right. So, you know, they've been part of a bunch of different governments and that they've left. Uh, they might leave this one. They might have a seventh flag. We're going to have to change all the amusement park names. Oh, no. <laughs> that might. Um, I, you know, it's one of those things like, um, like I was saying, you know, it's at some point earlier in the conversation, like, uh, it, for many many years, there you don't have a uh, you know the it's it it's not con- a certain kind of action or 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 presidential you know behavior or whatever it is is not contemplated. So nobody thinks about whether what the Constitution might say about it. And then you know someone uh, you know makes a, uh, a decision that's outside of the norm. And then everybody's like, "Oh my God, what does what does this thing say about it?" Um, which and and it's it's got all these little you know pieces in there, uh, which lay dormant for, for for could for could be for hundreds of years, and then something raises the issue, and we have to look at what the text is and 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 what it says and what it meant, and you know, and then all of a sudden everybody's got an opinion about it, right? So so nobody thought about it for a hundred years, and then within a week. Everybody's got some view about it, um, right? I, I, it's it's, it's uh, and then the con. At least me, I, I'm I, I'm I'm uh, I try to slowly come up with my views. So so it takes me a while to you know read and think through what it is. And meanwhile, there's this raging debate going on about what whatever section of the Constitution means, and I feel like oh, I don't know. Wait a second, hold on. This might be hard. Um, I don't know. I don't know the secession question. I know people are talking about it, thinking about it, but I don't know what the uh, what the answer is. I, I know that there's no process in the Constitution for it. Yeah, so I, don't think the the Const- I don't think the Constitution mentions secession. It just mentions, you know, again, in the co- probably in the context of the Civil War, the 14th Amendment, it refers to insurrectionists are bad, but it doesn't really define what insurrection is and it it doesn't equate Isn't that insurrection with secession. Like, like there's so many, uh, you know, we, uh, invasion, insurrection, you know, rebellion, war, religion. These things are all in the Constitution, but they're not, they're not defined. And usually, you don't have to define them. But now we have to think: what is insurrection? What is invasion? It's interesting that they didn't define them. Like it's, it's, it, it seems to be on purpose because they understood that the country will change. And that's kind of a deep understanding to, to think that when, when making the constitution. Yeah. I mean, I think if that's the case, and I think, I think it certainly was the case for, for some of the framers at least, um, right. That is really sophisticated, right. We're going to leave this, a lot of this document kind of open ended. Um, we use phrases like, well, this is the 14th amendment now, but equal protection and, um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the bill of rights, uh, Due process of law, uh, freedom of uh, free exercise of religion; these sort of ambiguous phrases, uh, with the idea that they will be filled up and given content by the generations. But that also, you know, some there, there's, there's definitely a view among some of the justices and a lot of people who study the Constitution that that that's not what the framers, you know either not what they wanted or not how we should read their frame, their intent. And that what we should be doing is not sort of allowing people to update and the, the meaning of the constitution to fit the, the, give the, the, the changing circumstances of the day, but rather go back and find out, you know, what did invasion mean in, you know, 1787? Like what was the original public meaning of that word? And then that becomes fit the, the fixed meaning of the word. That's one of the, you know, the main, one of the major, if not the major interpretive debates about the constitution, like how to read it. Do you, do you read it according to what it meant? If you could figure that out from, you know, to the people who wrote it, or do you assume that the framers intended for it to the meaning to change over time? And if that's the case, how do we decide uh, how to give those ambiguous words content and who, who gives it? content is it the court is it some political process um a lot of questions there 
You know, and, and one issue that's come up a lot recently, and I, I shouldn't say recently, it's all the time basically, but it's it's struck home in various ways recently is freedom of speech. Because you see on all these college campuses, you know, people uh, marching and saying, you know, free Palestine from the river to the sea, which the implication is, as spelled out in the Hamas charter, is kill all the Jews between the river and the sea. So now, does freedom of speech allow for cause of death? Or like, where, where does freedom of speech really end? Because you're not allowed to call, for instance, for uh, death to the United States in freedom of speech. Like that's, I believe that's considered a crime. If you call for, if you actually incite people to commit crimes. Well, so yeah, I mean, there's a, there's, um, you know, specific rules about that. Like incitement can be prohibited. So you can, but incitement has to, is a very, is a term of art that, that basically the court decided in a case from the sixties said, you know, that, that in order to be prosecuted for incitement, somebody has to, um, sort of expressly call for the violation of the law in a circumstance where it is uh, likely to immediately occur, right? So that's that's why you have the, all this debate about, uh, for example, Trump's January 6th speech. Is that, was that an incitement or not an incitement? Mm. People have different views about that, right? Because because it has to it has to have this immediacy uh, for 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 it to to be pros- to be prosecutable. Um, if it, it and, and the idea is to distinguish between kind of abstract, um, you know, declarations of ideology and an actual call to immediate law breaking. And between those two, there's you know there's a lot of uh, unclear room. So, so but the but at least so far the court has been very, you know, it's been very protective of free speech rights uh, in that through that incitement context. Now there are other other things that can get that that aren't protected by the first amendment that could come into play like threats like a true threat is not protected um by the first amendment like if i email someone and say you know i should just kill you is that prosecutable um maybe uh (laughs) like if it's like um so there it has to be the government would have to prove that you uh I, i think it's sort of a combination that you really did want to, you know, kill somebody and that it was understood by the, the listener as being as, as posing like a real, a reasonable fear of, that you're going to do it. Like it's sort of a, com- a combination of kind of an objective standard and a subjective standard, but like, um, but yeah, true threats against like the president, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, that's a crime um, to, uh, and, and gets prosecuted from time to time, but, but they're, those are rare. You know, it's an interesting thing, the Constitution, because on the one hand, it seems like it's constantly violated and no one cares. Like, for instance, in the Constitution, it seems like the president actually has very few powers, right? So the, so the president, he has the ability to advise Congress on what laws should they, they should pass. He has the ability to kind of hang out with ambassadors and ministers of foreign countries. He has the ability to make treaties. He's the commander of in chief, but it's unclear what that means. Right. So like what actual laws or what, what actual power does the president constitutionally have as opposed to what he has now? Yeah. So the, that's uh, definitely the case that the presidential power has increased over time and congressional acquiescence in presidential power basically is, you know, been, been part of the, the reason for that. And Congress has just not stepped up and done its job. For example, Congress hasn't declared war since World War II, um, right? So the president has the commander in chief power. The Congress has the declare war power. Those are supposed to be complementary, but Congress never declares war. And then the question is, you know, does the president have the power to unilaterally start hostilities somewhere? And 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 part of the part of the issue here is that the courts, the Supreme Court in particular, is doesn't want to jump in on many of these disputes. Like when you have the president and Congress in a battle over foreign affairs power, the court will sometimes step in, but usually they're like, uh, this is a political question. This is not something that the court should get involved with. But so you're right that the president, you know, has these enumerated powers in the constitution and they're fairly limited. Like if you compare the size of the, 
Article One, which gives Congress the power to the size of Article Two, which gives the president power. It's Article One is way longer and has a lot more stuff in there. On the other hand, though, the uh, this is an interesting difference in how the the text is uh, uh, reads between Article One and Article Two, which is in Article One it says the legislative powers here and granted are vested in the Congress, which indicates that it's all just the powers that are listed in the Constitution that the Congress gets, whereas the the executive power in Article Two, it says the executive power is vested in a president, um, right? It doesn't say the executive power is here and granted. Rather, it says the executive power. And so the, the idea, and this has been debated for 200 years, is the executive power meant something in 1787 um, beyond just what's listed in the Constitution. And and by, by not having the words here and granted in the Article Two, the indication is that all of that executive power, whatever it was, was given to the president. So it doesn't have to be necessarily everything spelled out in Article Two for the president to have the power. That's what the presidents have always said. Um, and there, you know, it's a it's just it's a strong argument based on the difference between those two. So, so, so the courts have kind of read a lot of inferred or implied powers into into what the president can do, like the power to exclusively. Um, do diplomacy, for example, is one of those prop powers. The power to remove executive officials, that's not in the Constitution, but the courts have said the president does have that power in most cases. So, um, so, so I agree that the presidents uh, have taken more power over time. I think part of the, the, the fault is with Congress for not sort of pushing back, but there is a textual hook in the Constitution for whatever that's worth that would signal that the president has more powers than just what's listed in the in the document. Okay, that that explains a lot. Then what about like, what's the deal with executive orders? Like, well, when a president makes an executive order, is that law? Yeah, yeah. So I think people have a misconception about what executive orders are. They they're not just the president saying stuff. Um, they have to be they have to be grounded in a, either a specific statute. And a lot of executive orders are just implementations of statute. Um, uh, and one example is there's this, this statute that gives the president the power to create national monuments. It's called the Antiquities Act. So when the president makes national monuments, the president issues, it's actually not an executive order, it's a proclamation, but the difference is just form, not substance. And the president's just implementing the president's power under the statute. So it either has to be grounded in a specific statute or some presidential power granted by the constitution, either one of those that are specifically enumerated or one that's inferred from the grant of the executive power to the president. And so when a president, you know, issues an executive order, tells like the executive branch to do, you know, consider small business uh, 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 considerations whenever making a rule, the president's just using their kind of their power to run the executive branch to tell the agencies under the president's control, you got to do this. And I'm the head of the executive branch. I'm telling you, you should do this. Now, there are some there once in a while, there'll be a, a controversial executive order. Like a war, like 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 sending troops to a war. Yeah. And, keep, and sending troops to war, keeping them there, absent a de- declaration of war. Uh, those aren't probably done through executive order, but um, but but some sort of presidential action, right? And, and and there's nothing like special about an executive order other than it's called an executive order. It has a number. Um, uh, and so, yeah, so, so that, that the president, but even in that situation, um, even in that situation where it's not entirely clear if the president has some power in the constitution that they're acting under, there, in that case, they will usually the president will usually ask the Justice Department, the the legal department in the Justice Department called Office of Legal Counsel, which is a place I worked many years ago, um, which makes uh, actually issues memoranda and decisions of law uh, that you most of which are well, many of which are publicly available on the on the website that you can look at and read. Um, not all are, but. Um, uh, in which the which the Justice Department, you know, tries to explain why the president has this power. Of course, you know, they're biased, right? They work for the president. So they tend to be pro-presidential power documents, but they're not they're not 100 um, uh, uh, percent, you know, pro-president. There is some division. At least there's a norm that there's a division between this Justice Department who 
opines on what powers the president has. And the president, whose lawyer, most you know, close lawyer is the White House counsel, who's viewed as the personal kind of more, much more closely, not related, but a, a, a much closer counselor to the president than the, the Justice Department. I, 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 is this making sense? I'm, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, so what I'm wondering is like, let's take Afghanistan as a situation. Like uh -huh. how did the Justice Department justify, um, again, I'm not making a political opinion whether it's mm -hmm. right or wrong. I'm just curious, how did they justify not having Congress not requiring Congress to issue a declaration of war against Afghanistan. We fought a whole war there for like 20 years. Yeah, um, right. And 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 there are many other examples also, right? And I mean, I think the, I, um, and there may be specific rationales that apply to Afghanistan, but not Kosovo or whatever. But, uh, but I mean, generally the idea is that if, that the president has this sort of inherent power to protect the the country through military through their through the president's commander in chief power, and the declare war power is is viewed by the executive branch as being a a, a kind of a minor, uh, like some like a a legal action that has some domestic law implications, like certain things maybe don't kick in if Congress hasn't declared war or not. But the president has always, you know, taken the view, even up against the war powers resolution. So Congress has tried to limit the president's authority to stay in conflicts over time. And presidents have always viewed that as an infringement on the president's commander in chief power. So it's always based on a very broad understanding of the commander in chief power as a power to protect the country and promote federal, uh, promote national interests through military uh, actions. Uh, right. This is an area where Congress could could, you know, fight back because Congress does, in addition, have the power to declare war, also has the powers of the purse. Right. Con the money is appropriated by Congress. And so if Congress really wants, you know, to, to pick a fight with the president that and really, you know, take action, they could cut off the money for the the, the military effort. Of course, that and I think Congress has threatened that on occasion and and, and it's not politically uh, you know, uh, you know, it has political problems because you have troops already in the field. And so what, what does that, the cutting off of money mean for that, you know, for, for them? But con my point is only that the president has taken a very strong interpretation of the commander in chief power. Congress could take action to kind of push back on that, but it, 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 it really hasn't. The war powers resolution notwithstanding, it, it really has kind of let the president, president do what the president wants. Well, you know, all these issues, of course, revolve around my main worry, which is civil war happening in the next few years. Yeah. I mean, I remember in 1989, I was 21 years old and Tiananmen Square happened in China. And I asked a friend of mine, I, I, I was 21. I asked this friend of mine who was from China. I'm like, does, does this make you happy? Because, oh, this is a, a statement of freedom that maybe China is going to be free, whatever. I didn't know what that meant then. And I still don't know. But and he, he said something very interesting. He said, no, he doesn't like it because he has old parents in China and he basically likes the status quo because old people have a harder time with change. And as I get older now, I understand what he means. Like <laughs> Me too. Me too. For, for good or for bad, I really don't want a civil war, as exciting as it might sound. And, uh, uh, you know, so I get concerned about all of these constitutional questions that seem like it's really getting to this life or death point with, with all these issues going to the Supreme Court. So I, I appreciate you coming on to the show. You know, Jay Wexler, professor at Boston University, author, among other books, of The Odd Clauses, Understanding the Constitution Through 10 of Its Most Curious Provisions, and many other books that hopefully we'll talk about on, on future podcasts, including, I want to read your book about Satanists. That sounds really interesting. Um, what's the oddest clause for you in the Constitution? I love the Third Amendment, uh, the quartering of troops, and uh, it's just it's um, like it's 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 a clause that's never come up. It came up once in one case once, uh, which is actually how I start my constitutional law class with that one case. It's not even a Supreme Court case. Um, it's just it's it's something that was so important to the framers. Right. I mean, it wouldn't be there if it weren't. It wasn't. Yeah, There's number nothing three. It, it's number three. It's pretty Amendment. high up, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, right after freedom of speech and the right to bear arms, it's like right. you cannot have soldiers force their way into your house and, and live there. 
right? And and uh, like it's worked really well, uh, right? So some people think it's just silly, um, uh, but the the other view is that it's uh, like so clear and that 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 it's just that it's it's doing its work. It's doing you know best the best work of any clause in the Constitution because it's it's never you know really it's never happened. Well, it has happened. I mean, I think it did happen during the Civil War, but so that's my that's kind of my favorite. You know, do you know the stand-up comedian Eric Andre? I don't think so. Uh, you probably, you, if you saw his face, you would recognize him. He had a yeah. show, the Eric Andre Show, and he's been in some movies, some TV shows. But anyway, I've seen his act in person, and uh, his first bit is, "What the hell is the Third Amendment about?" Oh, yeah. And he goes <laughs> nice. all into the Third Amendment. So <laughs> I, I don't know if that ever made it onto a Netflix special. It probably did. But if I if I find that clip, I'll I'll send it to you. It's 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 all about the Third Amendment. He says it's the weirdest thing in the Constitution. So he agrees with you. Oh, good, good, good. The Onion did a great piece on the Third Amendment, a classic piece about like the anti-quartering, the National Anti-Quartering Organization celebrates its 230th successful year or something. It's really great. <laughs> That's funny. Well, uh, Professor Wexler, thank you so much for coming on and answering my questions. I hope all of these situations get resolved peacefully. If not, please come on again and talk about them. <laughs> and I, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate that. Thank you. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. With the Internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. In fact, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash podcast free. All lowercase, shopify.com slash podcast free, shopify.com slash podcast free. <laughs> 